Hello there. We are going to go ahead and read chapter 3 of The Clay Marble by Ming Fang Ho. Let's begin. Chapter 3 Sounds of splashing water and soft laughter drifted into my sleep. Drowsily, I wondered who was taking a morning shower by the well in our bamboo grove at home. Then I blinked, my eyes open, saw the silhouette of our ox cart wheel next to me, and I remembered where I was. The dawn sky was just beginning to glow, but already people were up and bustling about. Nia was nearby, tending a cooking fire. Her face was as powdery smooth as a lotus in bloom, and the morning light made her cheeks glow. Mother, too, looked refreshed and relaxed as she helped Nia fan the small fire. I folded up my sleeping mat and stashed it in our ox cart. Quietly, I walked over to them and sat down in my mother's lap. With her warmth behind me and the flames in front of me, I felt very snug and secure. Really, Dara, you're too big to sit like this, Mother said. But she made no move to push me away. Instead, she started to stroke my hair. Nia smiled at us. Sleep well, she asked. I nodded, too content to say anything. Mother held me for a long while, then nudged me aside. There must be something Dara could help with, she asked Nia. Well, you could help carry some water back from the well, Nia suggested, smiling at me. Jean Tu's there right now. Jean Tu? I asked. My cousin, you met her last night at dinner. Vaguely, I remembered the girl sitting across the fire from me, but at the time I had been too engrossed in the steaming white rice to pay her any attention. I had no idea what Jean Tu looked like. Don't worry, she'll recognize you, Nia said laughing, as if guessing my thoughts. She handed me a bucket and waved me off toward the well. I strolled past clusters of people, all busy preparing for a new day. There was nothing to mark one campsite from another, but I could sense where one family's space ended and another's began. Like raindrops merging at the center of a lily pad, the members of each family gathered around their own cooking fire, a child often cradled in the lap of its mother's sarong. As far as I could see, the campsite stretched in every direction. Their brown thatching relieved by flowered sarongs fluttered on laundry lines, or trays of red chili drying in the sun. I soon reached the well. It had been dug in a small clearing and fenced in by a wall of scraggly branches. Pivoting on a tall post next to the well was a bamboo pole with a bucket dangling on the end. Dozens of children were lined up, waiting their turn to dip the bucket into the well. They all seemed to know one another, and there was a lot of jostling and teasing. I looked around for Jean, too, but couldn't find her. Hey, over here, I heard someone call. I turned and saw a tall, thin girl waving at me, with a chubby baby balanced on one hip. You're Saroon's sister, right? the girl asked. I nodded. I'm Jean, too, she said. Her shoulder-length hair was pulled back from her face and fastened with a shiny metal clasp. She brushed a strand of hair behind her ear impatiently as she looked at me. How old are you? She asked. Twelve, I said. Well, I'm thirteen, she announced smugly. Squinting against the light, she studied me for a moment. Funny, you don't look much like your brother, she said. He's good-looking, not like you. Behind her, some girls giggled. I flushed. I had never thought of myself as pretty, but nobody had come this close to telling me I was actually ugly either. I knew my sarong was muddy and my hair uncombed, but another few buckets of well water would change all that. I glared at John too, and she watched me grinning. I reached out and touched the baby's foot. This your brother? I asked her. John too nodded with a touch of pride. He's cute, I said, not like you. The same girls who had just now giggled at me burst out laughing. For a moment, Jean Tu looked taken aback. Then she joined in the laughter, her eyes crinkling up. I relaxed. The baby started to squirm, and Jean Tu shifted him over to her other hip and jiggled him to keep him quiet. He had big round eyes and a thick thatch of shiny black hair. I reached out and tickled him, and he squealed in delight. What's his name? I asked. Naboot? but we just call him Baby. I take him to the lunch truck every day, John True said proudly. That's why he's so chubby. 
What's the lunch truck? I asked. Chantu studied me a moment. You could do with some visits to it yourself, she said. That's where you get a free meal, a hot one. Any child who stands in line at one of the feeding stations gets a plate of food from the relief officials. You just bring your own plate and spoon, and the food's great. Yesterday, we had eggplant curry over rice. She rubbed her brother's round tummy and smiled. Didn't we, baby? I wasn't sure what John Tu was talking about, but before I could ask, it was our turn at the well. John Tu grabbed her bucket and walked to the pole by the well. As I hesitated, she turned around and flashed me a grin. Come on, I'll show you what to do, she said. Just follow me. After we had filled our buckets, I followed her back to our campsite. The four grown-ups were sitting around the fire, eating some of the leftover rice from dinner, and Jean Chu and I joined them. After breakfast, Sarun started building a shelter nearby, hammering four bamboo poles into the ground and tying cross poles over them, while Nia stitched together more roofing from palmetto leaves. Dara, come help us, Mother called. Soon I had strung up a laundry line between our cart and Nia's, and my spare sarong was flapping gaily in the breeze. As, I, as a finishing touch, my brother hung a cloth hammock from the branches of a teak sapling nearby and invited John Tu and me to sit on it. As we sat there swinging gently back and forth, I felt that I had settled down quite happily at the border. We were still swinging on the hammock early that afternoon when John Tu sat up and claimed that she could hear the faint rumble of the food truck. Come on, she shouted, jumping off the hammock so abruptly that I nearly fell off. She rushed to her tent and grabbed a tin plate and spoon with one hand and her baby brother with the other. Hurry up, she called, and bring your own plate with you. With that, she was off, running toward the sound of the truck, her brother bouncing up and down on her hip. I picked up my tin plate and spoon and followed her. As we ran, we were joined by dozens of other children. They darted out of tents from beneath ox carts and down trees waving spoons and plates in the air as they headed toward the main road. From a tent nearby, one little boy emerged clutching a bowl. His trousers slipped down from his waist as he started to run, almost tripping him. For a few steps, he tried to hold on to his trousers as well as the bowl, then gave up and left his trousers on the ground in a heap before continuing stark naked. I laughed and kept running after Jean too. I could see the food truck now, churning up clouds of dust, it careened down the winding dirt road, stopped next to a signpost that had been that had big red three written on it. Quick, we have to get in line, Jean Tu shouted. By the time we got to the truck, there was already a big crowd of children there. I held onto Jean Tu's shirt as we jostled for a place. Under the noonday sun, the string of children wound far across the bare, dusty fields. There must be hundreds of us here. I thought. Most were about five or six years old, but there were some older children as well, like Jean too. They often carried a baby on their hip. At the front of the line, two huge pots had been unloaded from the truck, and a burly man was ladling out food from them. Two other men stood nearby, hoisting the empty pots back to the truck and carrying more full ones down the ramp. A young woman in khaki trousers and short hair looked on from the truck, earnestly writing in her red notebook. When my turn finally came, I held out my plate just as all the other children in front of me had done. My mouth watered. I watched the man ladle out a mound of steaming white rice and splash another ladle full of some yellow squash stew over it. Just the smell of that stew, I thought happily, could fill me up and float me away. Behind me, Jean Tu awaited her turn. Patiently, she held out her plate for her share of food as I stood off to one side. Then, careful not to spill even a drop of the stew, we threaded our way over to a bit of shade under an acacia tree and sat down. Jean, too, was very good to her brother, spoon-feeding him the best part of the stew, even though I knew she must be hungry, too. As for me, I dug right in, wolfing down huge mouthfuls. All around me were children eating their heads bent over their plates. You know, I said between mouthfuls, my brother kept saying there'd be food at the border, but I didn't quite believe him. And now you do? 
That's a strange thing. It's hard for me to believe it, I said. It's almost too good to be true. Jean Tu laughed. This is nothing, she said. Wait till you see what they give us out at the real food distributions for the grown-ups. That's even better. I sat back, leaning against the tree, and breathed a deep sigh of contentment. There was a morsel of meat left on my plate, which I had been saving till last. Slowly, I spooned it up and swallowed it. How could anything be better than this? And that is the end of chapter three. We will pick up with chapter four tomorrow. I hope you're enjoying the book.